Good day and welcome to the Burger King India Q3 FY22 earnings conference call hosted by Edelweiss Securities Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Nihal Mahesh Sham from Edelweiss Securities. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you, Aman. On behalf of Edelweiss, I would like to welcome you all to the Q3 FY22 Earning Conference Call of Burger King India. From the management today, we have Mr. Rajiv Varman, CEO and Whole Time Director, Mr. Sumit Zaveri, Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Kapil Grover, Chief Marketing Officer, and Mr. Prashant Desa, Head of Strategy and Investor Relations. I would now like to hand over the call to Mr. Rajiv Varman for his opening remarks. Over to you, Raj. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And I hope uh, you and your families are safe uh, as we, we continue this uh, uh, Omicron phase. Uh, I think it has been an exciting quarter for us, actually a very good quarter for us. Uh, we delivered uh, revenue-wise uh, 280 crores in sales, which is a uh, 14% uh, higher than 245 that we delivered the pre previous quarter. So a good quarter. And uh, I'm going to stop using the word recovery uh, because, uh, you know, our ADS, our average daily sales, uh, actually surpassed the pre-COVID numbers. So with, the, with this quarter, we ended up at 104% of uh, pre-COVID uh, quarterly sales. Uh, so that was an exciting number as well. This was driven uh, predominantly by our sales that come through our delivery, which continues to stay uh, stable at 160% of pre-COVID numbers. Uh, Dine-in sales also recovered. Uh, if you recall, our Q2 numbers were about 65% uh, over uh, pre-COVID sales. They moved from 65 to 78%. So that was uh, also an improvement. Um, our uh, regional-wise, you know, west we recovered 119%, south and east we were at 108%, and then north we have uh, still a little, we had a little room of recovery, we were at 95 However, in December, we crossed the 100% mark on the north numbers as well at 102 So looking at the December exit number of Q3, as we kind of exited uh, Q3, uh, delivery sales, uh, ADS, uh, you know, 166%. Dine-in was recovered 86%. Uh, West was uh, at 126. South and East at 115. And North, as I said, was 102%. So very, very good uh, recovery in sales. And you know, this is on top of you know us doing only 75% of the traffic. So uh, we have done a, a good job in uh, with menu in the last uh, you know few quarters, uh, moving up the check to a substantial number. Uh, and uh, hoping that uh, this moving forward into uh, Q4 and then moving into the next year, uh, we are looking at, uh, you know, as the traffic recovers uh, to surpass all these sales. So good, good quarter from, from that perspective. Also, just a quick note on, on the restaurant level uh, EBITDA. Uh, we delivered 48 CR, which is 17.2. Uh, all these are post India's numbers. Uh, this is more than, uh, you know, the Q2 number of 40 CR, which was at 16.6. So that's, uh, that went up uh, as well. The company EBITDA was at 32.8 uh, CR, 11.7%, uh, which is again over the Q2 numbers, uh, which was at 10.4%, which is at 45 CR. So good, uh, good uh, from that perspective as well. And finally, just on the Indonesian acquisition, uh, so, you know, we, as you recall from our uh, past calls, uh, that, uh, you know, this, uh, we had the send in, first of all, our board had approved the offer, uh, approved the offer to go ahead and buy Indonesia. And uh, post uh, board approval, we made a proposal to the seller uh, that was also accepted. And the latest is that our shareholders have also approved this transaction. So thank you very much for that. Really, uh, thanks for all the support on that. Uh, this is an acquisition of uh, about 83.24% of the Indonesian business. Uh, enterprise value is at 183, which is clear of uh, uh, debt-free uh, basis. So that's uh, on, on that side. Uh, just a quick couple of notes on our key pillars. We continue to you know, build our restaurants. We build uh, 20 restaurants in this quarter, uh, moving up uh, to 294. In fact, one restaurant just opened uh, yesterday, 
and we had 295. And uh, we continue to build restaurants. We have nine in construction, and another 65 waiting in pipeline as we kind of move them into construction and forward. Uh, the BK app, a uh, couple will spend some time talking about the BK app, but uh, great to work there by the marketing team. Uh, we have moved that uh, quarter over quarter, uh, you know, app sales by 41%. So thank you, couple, and thanks for all the work you're doing. Uh, and, and just on the cafe, you know, we have opened 18 cafes. Now, if you recall, we had talked about opening cafes in Q4. Uh, we pulled it up front and uh, and we opened 18 cafes in Q3. Uh, there are still eight or nine of them in construction as we speak today, and more going into construction uh, into in, in for for the Q4 uh, quarter. Uh, Stana menu continues to be strong. Uh, you know, it is continuing to be accepted by a millennial audience, and a couple will talk a little more about uh, that. Uh, so that's just a basically a top level uh, you know summary we will go dive into these areas in the, on this call uh, what i'll do is now i will turn it over to prashant uh, prashant will carry you through some of the numbers and then and then uh, sumit zaveri and kapil will kind of follow after prashant so over to you prashant thank you raj um, so great uh, great introduction and uh, Coming to slide number five, uh, you know, we are, as Raj mentioned, as we speak to 95 uh, restaurants, you know, uh, this year our target was to touch 320. We are well on course to deliver 320 restaurants. Uh, next year, as you know, our target is 390, so we will continue to do that. Uh, you will notice in slide number five that, you know, we have not put the restaurant opening number score FI. Uh, you know, 23, 24, 25, we've gone to the MSB, a target of 700. And you will see later on also the guidance slide, uh, we have kind of uh, moved that. And the reason I wanted to kind of share with all of you, is you see, we have actually delivered on every single guidance that we have shared with you, uh, be it with respect to store openings, be it with respect to, uh, you know, the ADS guidance, and be it with respect to our uh, gross margin guidance. So what we will do is, uh, you know, uh, Having achieved all the guidance for this year, we will come back to you guys uh, uh, for, you know, when we come back to you guys for the March quarter full year numbers, that's the time we will now revisit that guidance, uh, including the guidance for the store rollouts in Indonesia, including the guidance for the BK phase rollout. As a result of this, we kind of excluded it from here. But when we come back to you with March, there will be three more, two more numbers in addition to the India store rollout. It will be the BK Cafe in India rollout plus the Indonesia store rollout. Um, Raj spoke about this uh, in terms of uh, the slide number seven in terms of our recovery. What we have done is for your uh, benefit, we've broken this recovery down Q1, Q2, Q3, uh, financial year 2021 and 22 Y. Uh, if you recall uh, two quarters back, uh, we have chosen to share with you that our three COVID numbers. Uh, on an annual basis when we ended March 20 was 1 lakh 10,000 rupees. And we said that it's better to compare our performance this year uh, with the March 20 numbers because comparing with March 20 will always give you a, a very high SSSG. As a result of this, uh, you know, we will share this number with you for your benefit. As you will see in, Q, uh, in, in the last quarter as well, uh, the recovery continues uh, to grow and uh, we were at 114,000 of ADS for the, for the March quarter. Uh, sorry, for the December quarter. Uh, Raj spoke a little bit about slide number eight. Uh, as, as Raj mentioned, uh, the delivery recovery uh, continues to remain strong. And as you will see, in the first quarter of this financial year, our dining recovery has slumped to 32% uh, because of the second wave. We then moved up to 65 in Q2. And we ended Q3 at 78% recovery. But hardly to note was the December uh, number where the dining has now recovered 86%. Similarly, the, the recovery uh, on the delivery side uh, for December was almost 166%. Uh, if you look at the Q3 overall uh, number, uh, the dining business uh, currently is at uh, 47% and delivery is at 53 uh, if you guys will recall, uh, you know, uh, when we ended March 20 for the full year, uh, our dining business for 65% of our business, 
and delivery was about 35. You, you've known our view, uh, we've kind of shared this with you, that we believe we are predominantly a dining business. And as, as the world opens up, as schools and colleges open up, as, as the dining traffic kind of completely recovers, we believe, uh, you know, the, the balance of 60 by 35 should return back in and by 23. Uh, talking a little bit about slide, uh, slide number nine, uh, as I said, the recovery now stands at 104 percent, and if we just map by like December month, the recovery is around 111 percent. Raj again mentioned this uh, uh, because we have our MFDA gives us the, the rights to open restaurants all across the country. Uh, we shared with you our, our regional-wise uh, recovery. Uh, West has again led this recovery at almost 120 percent for Q3, uh, followed by South and East at uh, 108, and as Raj mentioned, uh, North, which was kind of lagging, uh, also in December crossed the 100 percent recovery number. Uh, what I will do is, you know, quickly turn it over to submit uh, our CFO to quickly share with you the highlights of our operating performance. Over to you, Sumit. Uh, I'll kind of uh, summarize, literally summarize what Prashant and Raj uh, took you through. Uh, the financial performance slide, which is slide 11, is literally the summary of uh, what we achieved during the quarter. Uh, we grew our sales by 14%, got to a 280 crores of sales. Uh, we achieved a margin of uh, over 66%. And you know, we've, you, if you've been tracking our performance, you will realize on quarter on quarter basis, we've been improving our uh, gross profit uh, margins. We are at 66%. We strongly as an organization believe that uh, uh, we should just continue to be where what we've achieved, you know, we improve on from there on. We strongly believe that what we've achieved is certainly sustainable uh, and we can build our base on that going forward. Uh, looking at the restaurant EBITDA margins, we got to a 17.2%. Again, there we've improved from what we achieved over the previous uh, quarter and uh, at a company level, 11.7% uh, in terms of uh, company level EBITDA. Uh, an improvement from 10.4 to 11.7 on a quarter on quarter basis. So it's been a good quarter. Uh, we believe that uh, we've created a base from where we can kind of work towards improving further. Uh, so with that, I'll just hand it over to Kapil, uh, who can take us through some of the initiatives that we took on the marketing side, which has uh, certainly helped us in achieving what we achieved in quarter three. Well, thanks, thanks, Sumit, and a very good morning to everyone on the call. Now, in the last quarter, we've seen very good improvement in our sales recovery, and especially dine-in, you know, while our delivery sales stayed very strong. Now, we've been focused on strengthening our brand, and Whopper is a key pillar of that strategy. You know, we continue to drive very exciting engagement programs and limited-time products to build that franchise. After a string of awards that we won for our social media campaigns, like Date the Whopper, which was around the Valentine's Day, and the great cricket hack which we did around the fancy, you know, 2020 cricket tournament. Uh, last New Year's, we launched an incredibly fun campaign to engage with the youth and help them stay sober on the first day of the New Year. You know, while people celebrated New Year's with abundant caution outside uh, or in the safety of their homes, uh, Burger King made sure that they didn't need to worry about a delicious flame grilled whopper or a crispy veg whopper to start their first day in the New Year on a good note. So the Sobo Whopper was a customized product and it was available exclusively on Burger King app. I'm very happy to share that the idea connected very well with the Indian youth and also got coverage in countries like South Korea, Australia, France and Italy. So that's where we continue to build the Whopper franchise. Now I move to slide number 14. You know, we've done a lot of foundational work on the Burger King app and we are now seeing very good momentum quarter on quarter with a growth of 41% in sales in the last quarter. We now have 177 e-bikes on the ground, delivering orders which are placed on the Burger King app. And we will continue to grow the percentage of e-bikes in our fleet. We also continue to invest in driving BK app adoption through digital marketing. And by the end of last quarter, we were at cumulative 2.35 million in stores and over 400,000 monthly active users on the Burger King app. So that part of the business continues to grow for us every quarter. We stay invested behind that. Now that brings me to the next slide, slide number 15 on BK Cafe. Now Raj spoke about the fact 
that we've been able to fast track this project and roll out 18 cafes by 31st December. Now these cafes are a mix of high street, drive throughs and malls so we can get learnings and improve the model before we scale up. So far, we've seen that the consumers have given very positive feedback on the menu, both hot and cold beverages and the food. We're also seeing some very good pattern and improving overall beverage sales and traffic in key day parts by offering this new proposition to our consumers. But as we said, it's, it's very early days for BK Cafe and we will keep you posted on how this progresses over time. Now that brings me to slide number 16. Now last quarter, we continue to grow stunner awareness in trial, that's our value proposition. Now if you measure this versus July 21, which is when we launched a 360 campaign around stunner, the stunner menu volumes have grown by 39%, which is in a way very strongly sort of correlated to dining traffic growth in the last quarter. So that tells us that the consumers have a very good acceptance and trial of the stunner menu, and we're getting fantastic feedback on the products. So that in a way sums up the marketing update for the last quarter. I will now hand it over to Prashant to talk you through the key performance indicators. Thanks, Kapil. Appreciate that. Uh, so friends, as I, was, uh, as I was sharing with you, earlier this slide used to be our guidance slide. Uh, given the fact that we have achieved all the three guidances that we shared with you for the current year, uh, what, we have, uh, what, we, what we want to do when we come back to you with March is now start incrementally sharing with you the new guidance uh, because most of our guidance will now need to be revised upwards from what it was previously. So we will now come back to you uh, uh, in the March quarter for your numbers with our new guidance on store openings. Uh, it will also include the guidance on, on BK Cafe as well as our guidance on the Indonesian operation. Uh, our, our view is that we should be able to uh, you know, now that uh, the shareholders have, have approved this, uh, we will be soon launching our QIP and uh, subsequent to the successful closure of QIP and acquisition of the Indonesian business, uh, we will come back to you uh, in the March quarter and guide you for the Indonesian business as well. Uh, now with CAFE starting, we will have to revisit our guidance upwards on the, on the gross margin side, on the same store side, uh, as, as Raj and Kapil both mentioned, still early days for CAFE. Uh, initial response continues to be extremely strong and promising, but we are just asking for another quarter from you, so that when we come back to you uh, with our March numbers, we, we guide you uh, much more appropriately uh, with, with, a, with a very strong degree of, of confidence uh, on that. So as a result of this, uh, you know, we kind of removed the previous guidance slide, and we will reinsert it in the, in the next quarter. Uh, in terms of uh, what's the update uh, on, on the transaction, as you know, uh, this was a related party transaction. Uh, these were related party transaction. The promoters were not allowed to vote. Uh, so the decision was really with the minority shareholders. Uh, so the minority shareholders overwhelmingly have voted in favor of, of acquisition of the DK Indonesia business. Uh, we continue to be very, very strong believers not just in the Indonesian story and the Indonesian Burger King story, but in its, in its growth as well. Uh, now, uh, you know, we have to go and, and raise this money to acquire this, uh, this business. Uh, so we will uh, very soon be launching our QIP as a result of this. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, with our current existing and new investors embracing our, our Indonesian purchase, uh, we should be able to acquire the Indonesian business. We also know other development now with us acquiring the Burger King Indonesia business. Uh, you know, we have proposed a name change to restaurant brand Asia Limited. Uh, the shareholders have again approved that. Uh, we will now wait for the RSU, ROC approval before we kind of change this. So that's uh, that's it from our, our side, guys. Uh, a strong quarter. But just one small thought I, I want to kind of leave with you. This year was also like last year kind of marred with, uh, you know, uh, second wave and now the Omicron wave. So in, in all, we are actually looking forward to the next year. Probably will be a very, very big year for Burger King, uh, for the India business, uh, for the, with the, with the Indonesian business getting consolidated with cafe now. Uh, these are very uh, meaningful part of our business. Uh, hoping that next year we will have probably uh, much lesser or almost zero disruption because of this. Looking forward to the dining business again, uh, 
coming back, uh, the traffic bouncing back, as, as Raj had mentioned in the previous call, uh, during this COVID period, our check sizes have grown by about 40%. And if traffic comes back uh, vehemently uh, next year, FI23, uh, we will have a very different FI23. Uh, so with this, uh, we, we open the floor for, for Q&A. Uh, the team is here to take on any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. first question is from the line of Vicky Punjabi from JM Financial. Please go ahead. Vicky Punjabi, your line is unmuted. Request to please unmute your line and go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks for taking my question, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, sir. So, my, sir, my first question is uh, uh, is actually on the uh, on the margin front. Now, I was just comparing the current quarter with the December 19 quarter. Uh, so I see a gross margin expansion of 140 bips and an EBITDA margin expansion of 30 bips. Uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, it, you know when, I, when I look at two quarters in terms of character, uh, there is definitely a higher element of delivery in this, in this quarter versus, I mean, delivery makes this quarter versus, uh, say, a December 19 quarter. Uh, so, I mean, uh, just... Uh, one of the implications that I could draw out here is that, you know, if, if we have a same kind of a revenue per store and the delivery mix is higher than, and than what uh, the dine-in mix is, uh, it would have an uh, uh, adverse impact or on a like-to-like basis, the margin would be lower, the EBITDA margin would be lower. Uh, is this a true understanding or the fact is that, you know, the incremental prices on delivery does offset the, uh, the, the incremental expenses here? So, uh, Vicky, this is your, yeah. Uh, hi, Shantyu, you take? Thanks. So, Vicky, yes, uh, <clears throat> what, you are, what you are seeing is, uh, is correct that uh, dine-in and delivery uh, has a differential in terms of margins at, a, at an EBITDA level. Uh, but your question first saying, does the price differential offset the uh, impact? Yes, price differential and the idea of having a price differential is to offset and be competitive on the platform. So that does help retain the gross margins. Uh, there is an incremental cost to do that business and that does impact uh, on the EBITDA side. Uh, but what we've always been maintaining that as the business uh, starts recovering and as we see the restrictions on the COVID uh, coming off, we very clearly see that the business will move towards and tend to move towards dine-in. That's literally the character of the uh, QSR business in India, and that's what we've seen. If you uh, look at even our slides on what we have observed ourselves uh, of dine-in recovery, as the restrictions kept on moving out, we've constantly seen the, you know, the share of uh, dine-in increasing. You know, and if you see literally in the month of December, we got to 86% of our pre-COVID levels of dine-in. So while it does impact, we do strongly believe that as restrictions go back, we will go towards uh, and closer to the pre-COVID levels of dine-in delivery, uh, delivery ratios. That's, that's something which uh, we strongly believe. Secondly, you know, and I, I kind of did cover this as a part of uh, my mention, uh, the gains on uh, gross margin that we've got so far, we strongly believe that uh, uh, we should be, uh, we strongly believe that we will sustain it and only kind of uh, improve from uh, there on. So just to summarize, we strongly believe that we are a dining led business. As the restriction goes back, we will go towards a higher share of uh, higher share of dining. Uh, and uh, secondly, is that the gains on the margin side that we've got, the cross margin side that we've got, we will be able to sustain and only grow from there on. Okay. So, sir, I mean, as I, as I add, uh, yeah, sure. see, uh, this one thing I wanted to kind of build up on the kind of, uh, what Sumit mentioned in terms of, uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned, our check sizes during this period has gone up. So, though your percentage margin may have come down, 
But when you look at the dollar margin or the rupee margin per se, because your check sizes are expanded by uh, 40%, overall, uh, from a business standpoint, it's not made a very meaningful uh, difference. Though, on a percentage basis, it will look up here that way. But on an absolute basis, it's not made too much of a difference. Sorry, Vicky, go ahead. Sure. No, so I just wanted to, uh, you know, just clarify my understanding out here. What we mean is that, you know, delivery stays strong while dine-in recovers. So uh, overall, once the dine-in recovers completely, we will have a higher uh, revenue per store what we were seeing versus pre-COVID levels. And plus the margin, uh, the gross margin would continue to strengthen from there on, uh, you know, partly also, uh, I mean, uh, despite the dine-in proportions moving up. Is, is that my, is my understanding right out here? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, okay, sure. Vicky, uh, just to, you know, there's three, three numbers I want to share with you. Uh, we spoke about this in the last quarter. We said that we would exit this year, uh, physical year, in March, uh, uh, you know, going north of 66% on margins. We have already done that in Q3. We said that we would exit Q3, uh, we would exit this year, uh, physical year, uh, March, uh, getting sales to back to pre-COVID levels. We have already got this in Q3. We said that we will, you know, get to 320 restaurants uh, by March of uh, this year, uh, fiscal year, and we are well on track to hit those. So, uh, you know, that's why we, we kind of, you know, put this into a very good quarter because it helped us with all the opening ups and, you know, the market and the malls and so forth. It just kind of, you know, got us a quarter head start on, on all our numbers. And uh, and that's that's why we we are, we are kind of placing this as a as a good quarter. Right. No, sir. Yeah, definitely. It's 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 a it's a strong quarter. Uh, just one more thing, I wanted to understand on the BK Cafe expansion side. Right? I mean, while we are currently kind of piloting the model, uh, once we have a uh, you know uh, when once we firmed up on the model side, uh, there is something on the number of stores that's being expanded generally and then there is BK Cafe that comes in. So on the new launches, what is the thought process here? Do we, you know, currently go with uh, without the BK Cafe and then in three to four years we have to again renovate to get BK Cafe in or would we actually uh, go with uh, BK Cafe across most of our new store expansions? Uh, just wanted to understand the thought process on Cafe expansion. Yeah, Vicky, <coughs> Cafes are here to stay, right? Uh, so all our new restaurants are actually designed with cafes in them. Uh, so we will be opening cafes all across our, our portfolio. Now there's, uh, as I said, I think two quarters ago, that uh, you know there will be a full-fledged cafe, and then you know in a food court we will have a, you know what we are calling as a B model, uh, which will have a counter area and it'll have the 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 menu board and and the cafe menu over there. Uh, but, you know, we are now inherently building these into our designs. So all the new design actually already, we have already done that. So all the new restaurants that we are opening now already have cafes in, inside them. Uh, and this will continue as we continue to build restaurants next year and the year after that. I hope that answers that. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'll come back in queue for more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your questions, Vicky. Thank you. A reminder to our participants, please press star and one if you wish to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Anish Munka from JST Investment. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. So when I try to understand the long-term business economics of a QSR company, and please correct me if I'm wrong, customer retention plays a very critical role. So not just to check if the customer is coming back to us after visiting one, but also to check that is he or she coming to us in seven days, 14 days, or 28 days? And thereafter, to get data-driven insights as to how much integration are we able to make in their day-to-day -day life. So what does your data tell you, and where is the direction? Thank you. So, yeah, hi. Do you see that? Yeah, sure, Kishan. So, uh, hi. So we are, we are actually in the midst of, uh, you know, working on a very comprehensive CRM uh, tech integration and a long-term sort of play around uh, understanding customer through data. Uh, that is already uh, in, in the works and we should be rolling that out in, in the coming quarter. Uh, so far, what we are getting from researchers and customer interactions, uh, both qualitative and quantitative, is that we are seeing 
a good incidence of our products on the Stana menu and the new launches that we've done uh, in every check. So customers are trying it and it sustains over time. So we're seeing that stickiness on the menu. Uh, but as I said, we are in the midst of, you know, working on a very comprehensive CRM program and we should be able to share a lot more database insights in the coming quarters. Noted. So secondly, on the menu, so as we see it, the majority of India remains a dal roti and chawal eater and would go for a QSR not more than once a weekend. You know, as we saw with KFC when they were struggling 10, 15 years ago, to become an everyday brand, they introduced the rice box and that changed everything. So how is Burger King planning to position themselves as a weekday brand as we understand that's where the untapped volumes are? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Anish, for that question. <clears throat> if you actually uh, reflect back on, you know, QSR usage in India today, it's approximately about eight times in a given month, right? So uh, that's how often uh, they're going into the restaurants. Those numbers in, you know, the other Asian markets, for example, China and Indonesia are significantly higher, uh, China being at about 28 times a, a month. Uh, and Indonesia is somewhere in between those two numbers. Uh, so that, that, that growth is happening as we speak now. Um, you know, in, when we came to India in 2014, uh, the concept of uh, burgers and uh, Western QSR was, was basically a snack. And, uh, and people would have that snack and then go back and have their dinner. Now we introduced and strongly went after the concept of uh, combos. And we really took the lead in making sure we came up with some fantastic introduction and strategies. Uh, you know, at that time we were actually taking a combo at 50 rupees. So take any product at 50 rupees became, became a combo. So we grilled that kind of culture at that time. We have not looked back from there. We continue to drive that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, experience with our customers. And today, if you look at our combo percentage, it's significantly climbed beyond what we used to do, which is at uh, 26, 30%. This has gone north of that. Um, the other two things that I'll tell you is, is how we learn that, uh, you know, these uh, repeat businesses, it's through products. It's through our product mix. So if you look at our product mix, uh, you know, we started the uh, King's Collection, which is a gourmet line of products. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, we, you know, we are expecting to sell a few of those. And now today we are selling upwards of 80 of those units per day. And that is not uh, with, you know, 100% of the traffic back in our restaurants. So there's, there's massive uh, room over there. That's sustaining. It is, it is not going up and down. It's sustaining. It's, it's continued in growth from there, which tells us that those uh, though that entire menu, that collection has resonance with our, with our clients and they like it. The second one is the stunner, the introduction, uh, you know, menu or the entry level menu. And, uh, and we shared those numbers with you, uh, or a couple shared those numbers with you. Those are gaining massive traction. And you can imagine we have not yet gone on TV this, this quarter. Uh, and, uh, the only promotion we had was last year, uh, as the event on, on, on television with, uh, with stunner menu. I think this is the other one which will gain and will drive people into our restaurants at the entry level for trials. And then, you know, we have a laddered menu to our King's Collection uh, to gain, a, you know, a check from, from there on. So as we look at the business, we feel strongly that we have put in the discipline and the item and the structure, menu architecture in place, which will give us long-term growth on not only a repeat business, but also on new trials because of the entry level menu. Just to add to what, uh, what Raj spoke about, you know, our, our menu being, uh, you know, in, in structured in a manner. Uh, to your question, we have also been very conscious of the Indian taste palette uh, in the design of the menu. From the day one when, you know, Raj set up the whole speech with the, with the leadership team, you know, the entire menu that we sell in India is an India exclusive menu designed to the taste preferences of the Indian consumer. And even today, we continue to stay focused on that. So ideas like, for example, the masala whopper is, is a whopper which is made for the Indian taste palate. And you'll see many more ideas that come out like that. For example, the tiki twist burger. It's got, you know, products and ingredients which are, because Indians like multi-textural food, it's got crispies and a spicy sauce, right? The makhani burger. So we have a menu which, which does reflect the taste preferences of Indian consumers.
Thank you, Mr. Munkar. Request to join the queue for any follow up. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Avi Mehta from Macquarie. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. I, I just had three questions. Uh, first, I wanted to kind of just understand is there any divergence in the gross margin between time and delivery? Uh, what I mean is, do people tend to order more premium products online versus offline? Or does the check size have any difference in the gross margin? Yeah, so first of all, Avi, uh, to your question on uh, check sizes, uh, we've actually seen very similar check sizes between uh, dining and delivery. Uh, from the perspective of gross margins that we realize on both the products is, uh, uh, is very similar in terms of uh, percentage as well as uh, rupee margin. The reason is that we do follow a price differential as a mechanism uh, to kind of uh, make sure that we do realize very similar cross margins from uh, both dining and delivery uh, as a business model. Perfect, that's clear. And so, you know, I was trying to kind of see if that is a if the changing mix has any risk or any, how I mean, does that have any impact for us? Much, but now it's, I'm clear on that. The second bit is essentially on the uh, you know. Uh, the operating restrictions that we have seen because of this new uh, COVID wave. Could you give us any color over there on how the customer response has been from this disruption? And more importantly, I know it's crystal ball gazing to some extent, but any expectations that you might have on by when do you expect Tynan to kind of get back to normal? Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Abhi. Uh, if you if you reflect on what's just globally happening, right? There's markets now opening up. Uh, UK is one of those markets uh, that substantially opened up. Uh, we are seeing here, for example, in Karnataka, uh, just recently they kind of opened up and removed the weekend curfews. Uh, those 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 kind of hit very hard uh, to the business when there's a curfew on the weekend where. We do a lot of business, so those those are slowly, uh, you know, kind of uh, being taken up, uh, off. And now uh, you're absolutely right. We don't have a crystal color. Uh, we don't claim to to have a, a handle knowledge on, on how this is going to progress. But all that we're seeing around uh, is that, uh, you know, while we had a kind of a restriction here in January as Omicron kind of came and set in, it is kind of, uh, you know, from whatever we are seeing in terms of the markets opening up. Kind of going into the rear view mirror slightly. Uh, I, I would say that cautiously because uh, we have seen this uh, go back and forth, and everyone on the call is aware of that. So, uh, but uh, you know, it, 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 for us, we, we we are looking forward to a very very strong next year uh, because we have see the, the discipline is we have put the menu, the architecture, the business economics, and the way we have structured our restaurants in the last two years, well planned, ready for the next year. So we, we dressed ourselves mentally and physically in our restaurants with all the initiatives we have taken. A uh, good example is this app. You know, we launched our own app. While we were doing, you know, transactions on delivery through aggregators, doing a fantastic job with that. Uh, mm -hmm. We were spending, you know, way above the, the average in the industry in terms of daily sales through aggregators. But we bought the dis discipline of coming up with this app. We have g gained 41% quarter over quarter transactions on our app. This is a very strong tool. It's going to help us our consumers better. It's also going to give the last mile kind of experience, a strong experience uh, to our consumers. So this is another you know, tool that we prepared going into to next year. So if you would look at the dress up, you have got cafe ready to rock and roll for next year. We have got an app uh, that is very strong and, uh, you know, gaining momentum. We have got an entry-level menu stunner, which we launched during COVID, which is gaining traction and gaining gait. You will see that this will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that we will be mass advertising across the country, right? So that's also in, pl in place. And then finally, we have this, uh, you know, the, the growth of our restaurants, which continue in, in the direction. We have, we have not missed a beat after we came after the second wave. We haven't missed a beat. We have put up a pipeline together. Today we have 65 restaurants in our pipeline. Uh, we have uh, eight or nine on, in construction as we speak. Uh, so we are, we, are, uh, we are not skipping a beat. We are rock and roll for next year. I feel very strongly about that year. So, sir, if I understand correctly, you're saying that as of now, it seems um, 
the consumers are taking it in it in their uh, stride and we should uh, we are i mean given what we've done uh, it seems hopefully kind of uh, as they say touch wood or fingers crossed things should kind of fall in place for next year is that understanding i just want to clarify that yeah alish as a company what you do is you prepare yourself right yeah. you prepare yourself you know if the business comes in next year are you prepared for it are you prepared if there is going to be restrictions and and what i'm saying is this company has prepared itself from all ends from technology from the food side the way we are constructing our restaurant the way we are moving forward with our menu we have prepared ourselves to to actually go head on with the business next year we expect and we feel strongly about next year and uh, and uh, we are prepared uh, we have uh, we have we have put all our tools in to to together to move forward next year thank you mr mehta request to join the queue for any follow ups the next question is from the line of akshin thakkar from fidelity international please go ahead yeah uh, congratulations team uh, on a good set of numbers i had two questions one was a housekeeping question and one was generally a criterion question housekeeping question first uh, on the call you mentioned that your margins across you know delivery and dining on gross margins are same just wanted to double click on that a little bit so if you have higher prices and gross margins are are same does that mean that you are treating delivery charge net off from sales or as a part of calls or do you have it as other expenses because if it is part of other expenses uh, accounting would mean that gross margins on delivery higher and then at an ebitda level maybe you are similar so just your questions on that i'll wait for your answer and then ask my second question so takshay uh, one is that yeah, there is a price differential uh, there is also uh, a discounting that happens uh, in order to be competitive on the platform uh and hence that's the offset that allows us to maintain or manage uh, very similar margins between dine in and delivery to your question on the delivery charge for the cost that we incur uh that is uh, effectively kind of would sit part of the other expenses uh line on our bnl the, the cost that we incur to do that business which is part of other expenses line Okay, so if the understanding then is correct, the gross margins are similar for dine-in. Uh, sorry, for delivery, that would mean that your EBITDA margins are lower today. On the on the delivery side, yes, because there is a cost of uh, incremental cost of doing that business. Yes, absolutely. And uh... okay, and when you when you compare, you know, you mentioned that you started doing in-house delivery, you have e-bike. When you compare cost of delivery for Uh, you know, uh, self-fulfilled orders versus on platforms. Is there a difference today on the number of cost of orders? So uh, at the moment, uh, actually, we just kind of starting to build that entire piece, and our intent is uh, really speaking strategic in nature. When we are saying we want to do our delivery delivery on our own, and if I was to kind of just market the entire piece. Uh, the mm-hmm. first part, and you know, in in one of the questions that I think Anish had asked. you know we want to effectively just uh, kind of make sure that we understand our customers better so that we can service them better that's the first part that we want to kind of work towards the second part is the experience that the customer gets when he will be gets the food at home we want to make make sure that that experience is kind of uh, far more superior when the uh, when the order gets delivered through our own platform the third piece you know and the and raj was just talking about the technology investments that we've done uh, and you know our today our technology investments are done not from the perspective of just in uh, delivering or servicing the customer purely from delivery perspective but to engage with him on all different platforms or all different ways in which we service or connect with the customer be it delivery be it dining be it take away so it's a it's a completely different uh, perspective with which we are just building this entire environment uh, of the en- environment uh, delivering or having our e bikes is one piece uh, at this point in time we are higher in terms of cost we would be higher than what we would incur uh, with respect to aggregators uh, as far as we are concerned but we there also we kind of very clearly laid out the path of how uh, we would get in line with uh, what we incur uh, with respect to aggregator as compared to what we with uh, aggregators very clearly and we see as, well, as we get scale 
uh, we would effectively be able to kind of get in line with those costs as well. Okay, got it. Uh, the second question is a little more, uh, you know, quickly raising it. I'm just uh, looking at slide 11 in your slide deck, and I'm comparing margins from uh, you know, Q3, where, uh, you know, your overheads seem to have grown more or less in line with sales. I'm talking about restaurant level overheads, and the margin improvement essentially comes from, you know, a little bit of gross margin improvement and corporate overhead improvement. And and you are let's say at, you know eleven and a half twelve percent handled on company level bit time and you think if it has to go to low teams mid teams wherever you know it lands up happening the part to that in your view will be better absorption of corporate overhead or do you see that you know uh, there is some scope of operating leverage on employee or you know other expenses that is that you know you've seen recovery but overhead absorption I would thought at an you know above uh, sort of corporate EBITDA level would have been slightly better, but but that seems to be growing in line. Now, it could be possible that, you know, in Q1 and Q2, maybe you had costs which were lower and as businesses come back, you ramped up those costs. So maybe future may be different. Just wanted to get your thoughts, you know, you know think about margin in your business. Will it be A, gross margins? Will it be B, corporate overhead? Or will it be C, you know, other restaurant level overhead? Thanks. Uh, so, uh, maybe a child just kind of, uh, uh, answer that and then uh, maybe Raj can add, uh, add to that actually. So very clearly one is, uh, one is uh, gross margin and we've been saying that we will work towards uh, improving the gross margin uh, through various efforts, uh, growth in scale uh, to kind of bringing new categories and cafe is a classic example of that uh, which we strongly believe should help in improving the gross margins from where we are. Today. So that's the, that's the first part. Uh, the second part, and you know, uh, initially when we were talking about the recovery, uh, we spoke about saying the way we expect the business to kind of uh, move uh, towards more time in as the recovery kind of. We very clearly at, at the same time understand that, uh, you know, the opportunity that we have uh, with respect to the sales that we can achieve at the store level uh, is not fully captured in as we still are getting out of uh, COVID. Uh, so effectively at the store level, we expect that as we continue to kind of improve uh, our sales from the current levels, we will see the broader absorption of the costs, uh, fixed costs at the uh, store level as well. Uh, one of the key ones uh, would be on the rent side and that's something which we expect that should kind of also help improve. And then largely, you know, there is, uh, uh, the, we expect that the corporate costs in terms of growth will grow at a sl slower pace in terms of, uh, as compared to the larger growth in revenue that we will see. And, you know, when we talk of uh, larger uh, revenue growth, it will be same store as well as uh, new expansion. Uh, so we do expect over a period of time, effectively, even the corporate costs should start kind of uh, broad basing. Uh, from the current levels that we have. So we, it's, it's very clearly defined into three buckets, very clearly for us, gross margin improvement, a broad basing of uh, store level fixed costs largely on the rental side, and the broad basing of the corporate costs uh, on an overall basis. So that's how we will look at it. It's not going to be just uh, one line. Sorry, not Raj's case. No, that's, 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 a, that's a comprehensive answer. So basically, I mean, the, you know, your, your rents, I mean, that's a big chunk over there, right? If you look at that number over there, that's a direct reflection of uh, top line, right? So as, you, as, you, as your type top line grows, you move from, you know, MG or minimum guarantee rents towards, you know, percentage rents, right? So, so as that change happens, as volumes increase, you will find that number shrink uh, in the middle, uh, the expense line. And the corporate overheads that you can see between Q2 and Q3, you've seen a, a, a significant decrease in, in overall uh, corporate overheads. And those, uh, you know, as the business grows, and that's, that's why we call this a scale business, uh, a scale cash business, because as that number of restaurants grow, the number of, uh, you know, uh, the sales grows through, you know, those restaurants, cafe sales gets added on and so forth, it does not add additional, you know, uh, you know, corporate level kind of uh, expenses. So you will find that number kind of shrink, uh, you know, as and as we continue to grow. 
So that's, that's a direct. So both those lines are actually a direct reflection of the sales numbers on top, both existing restaurant sales as well as new restaurants coming in and adding new sales. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pratik Rangnekar from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, congrats on a good quarter. Uh, I think in one of the earlier calls, you had mentioned that uh, in the North region, uh, some of the protests and all were having an impact on your uh, revenues or your ability to capture sales. But if I look at the jump between the quarterly average and the December exit, I would have probably expected a bit more sharper jump in the North uh, area. Any thoughts on why uh, that region is lagging? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. The answer is no different than what we gave before. Uh, you know, it is exactly the reason for it. Uh, we have a significant of our portfolio in, uh, on metro stations. And as you can uh, look at the metro, especially in the MCR uh, area, it is still not back, right? It's running a percentage of what it used, uh, used to run pre-COVID. So that's a significant impact because those stores, uh, you know, we have, I think, between 18 to 20 stores in, in, that, uh, in, in that market, in that metro market. Also, if you see that, you know, we have uh, built, you know, briefly, basically half a portfolio up in the north. And many of these restaurants are in, in malls. And the number of malls also in the north is higher than and what we see in west or what we see in south. So you will find that, uh, you know, as the malls completely open up, whether, you know, it's this policy of uh, double vaccinated people going inside the mall, or today the malls are open, you can go to the food court, you can buy the products, but you cannot sit there and eat. Those things are still in place, right? They're still in place in several markets. And as those things get removed, and we come back to normalcy as uh, whatever the new normal is, then you will find that these will effectively click very quickly. Uh, very quickly you will find, because there's a captive audience, right? Metro is a captive audience, and so are the malls. So as soon as the restrictions are removed, very, you will see a very immediate uh, you know, action on the other side with sales increasing. And uh, that's just direct uh, you know, correlation for that. Got it, thanks. Uh, so one question on the gross margin part, it's very encouraging to see the continuous progress that we have made here. Any uh, color that, any more color that you can provide on how this has come across? Is there a pricing element here or uh, or maybe some, some, some breakup that you can provide between pricing and mix here? And also if you could quantify uh, maybe broadly the impact of RM inflation that you're facing this quarter. Yeah. So the first, first, uh, you know, I'll just quantify saying that we are supposed to hit 66% as we exited Q4. We have already done that. See, uh, basically, if you look at gross margins, right, how, how do these gross margins improve as you grow up? For example, I'll just make this simplify this. It's not as simple as it is, but I'll simplify this. You have a restaurant that is a, potentially a remote restaurant in a city where you're transferring your trucks uh, for one restaurant. Uh, as you build two restaurants, the same truck is carrying food for two restaurants. When you go from two to five restaurants, the same truck is carrying, you know, food for five restaurants. So your, your transportation cost, which is secondary uh, transportation cost, will continue to go down, right? So that has an impact on your total, uh, you know, uh, GP. Secondly, as you build a significant amount of portfolio in a certain market, then you are able to get local vendors, whether it's vegetables or other products, you can get local vendors there, and that drives down even more the transportation cost as well as, you know, bringing in more vendors is always effective in terms of total buying uh, ability and, and the cost of buying. So these things are cumulative, and, and you know, we have a very strong supply chain department, uh, you know, led by Sandeep Day, and, uh, you know, when we did this, uh, you know, in 2014, we had set this, uh, you know, tra travel journey. We had spoken about getting to 66. We had spoken about going from 66 to 68. None of that has changed. All the work uh, behind that, whether it's in transportation, whether it's in the way we, you know, get different new vendors to come in, or whether it's, uh, you know, basically engineering our products, whether it's going down to, you know, ingredient levels, we even negotiate ingredients on behalf of our, uh, you know, uh, suppliers that, uh, you know, process our, our uh, food. We, we go and uh, negotiate the ingredients so that ingredients purchased by them go cheaper 
and then that goes to, gets transferred directly to us. So it's just hard work, and uh, it's, it's not something that we are all brilliant people here. We're just hardworking group of people that continuously work hard every day to continue driving this number below, and, uh, and Sandeep and his team does, do a great job doing that. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Pranav Tendulkar from Red Enterprises. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, just two questions. Uh, what are the long-term view on the royalties? Uh, I, I might uh, have missed it in previous conversations. That is one. And second is, what is the uh, KPIs, top five KPIs and priorities for men? Uh, thanks a lot. Okay. So royalties, uh, you know, we, we kind of, uh, you know, have spoken about this several times. Well, I'll just kind of reiterate that. We started off, you know, in, in 2014 paying 2.5% royalties on restaurants we opened that year. The following year, the royalties went from 25 to 3%. And when I say we, we had 2.5% for the ones we opened in 2014, those were for 10 years, right? For 10 years, they will maintain 2.5% and then they will go up to 5%. Those we opened the following year, we had 3%, they say 3% for 10 years, and then go up to 5%. The royalties are capped at 5%, right? They're capped at 5%, and they don't go up from there. Our agreement, uh, our master franchise agreement, agreement is until 2039, right? So, so we have the luxury of a very good royalty rate, uh, and, and that royalty rate is capped. So that, that's uh, good news for Everyone investing in this is certainly very good news for all of us over here. Uh, now, the KPIs you're talking about, you know, the, the first KPI of this business uh, is the most important KPI, and that's traffic. How many people come into your restaurant on a daily basis? How many people place an order? Uh, you know, it's called, we call traffic as the blood of this business. The blood is, is, is what dictates every other number that happens in this business. So traffic will be one of the biggest and strongest KPI of this business. Sales, obviously, with our check uh, APC, you, you know, simple definition of sales, uh, as I tell uh, my, my, my team over here, is you know, how many people come in and how much do they buy. That's sales, basically, right? So that's a, that's a major KPI. Our gross margin we have spoken about in a, in a big way. Uh, it's, a, it's a major KPI. Our growth is, is, a, is a KPI for us. We want to make sure that we are continuing to grow. When we say sales, you know, we not only take sales of existing restaurants and new restaurants, we also look at things like cafe coming in, adding sales during breakfast day part. Cafe coming in and adding sales between lunch and dinner, right? So this is a very strong uh, initiative that we put in, whether it's uh, Stunner Menu, whether it's the King's Collection, whether it's the Cafe, whether it's our app, all these are to drive sales. So that's a major KPI. Growth is, uh, obviously, I just spoke about it, and obviously our, our restaurant level EBITDA margin and our company level EBITDA margin. So this is how we run our business. These are the boxes that we put on our chart. If you if you come and see our, our MBOs, our management business objectives, all our people have these business objectives on, on, on their MBOs. Hope that answers. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, due to positive time, we'll be able to take one last question. That is from the line of Suresh Pardeshi from Centrum Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, team. Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, uh, just two questions. <clears throat> the first question is on uh, if you can spend a minute or two, how we should look at the uh, BK Cafe business. So maybe if you can share some commercials, uh, just purely from the building our model perspective, next two to three years. Uh, maybe if you can outline what is the number we, which we are looking. And quickly follow up on that. So what is your experience? I mean, it's too short. I mean, almost a month and a half you would have spent uh, time on building this business, but. Initial feedback on the customer traffic and uh, things, how it is moving. Yeah, I'll, I'll turn it over to Kapil to give you, a, a, you know, what the customer reaction so far has been. It's been very positive. But uh, <laughs> just on the guidance and numbers, uh, I think Prashant said it on the onset, give us some time. We don't want to be sharing, you know, half numbers. We want to understand it very well. Uh, you know, when, when we say we have 18 restaurants open, many of them are open only for a, a week, maybe a little more than a week. So we don't want to, you know, uh, at this point sit here and uh, kind of, uh, you know, share half numbers. So we, please give us some time. We are extremely delighted with what uh, has happened with this cafe business. We are extremely delighted with the products that we have put forth. Uh, our, uh, our uh, you know, objective and 
subjective, both uh, quality and uh, qualitative and quantitative research, whatever we have done, that couple will share your share his, uh, his thoughts on that. But it has been overwhelmingly uh, accepted as a as a very good rollout, uh, and we are extremely happy with it. Uh, that's why you know we pulled it up. Uh, we are supposed to do this in this quarter. We did it in Q3, and we are not you know taking a pause. We are going forward and continuing to build these cafes. So it can tell you how strongly we feel about it. Couple, you want to add anything? Uh, just to add to what Raj said, uh, see, it, it's about how we have laid the foundation of this business, and you know, uh, and we continue to learn from all the experience that we're gaining from these cafes. Uh, first of all, good traction on the menu. We're getting good feedback, as I said in my my slides, on beverages, both hot and cold, and also in the food. Uh, you know, there is uh, consumption of a lot of hot beverages in the north because it's very cold there. A lot of cold beverages in the west because the weather, there's that, that mix will shift as the weather changes. So as I said, we'll keep learning from it. The food menu, good fashion, and we keep optimizing it. We keep adding new products, basic customer feedback, you know, and you will see that menu evolve over a period of time. In the next quarter, we will definitely have more to share with you on this business. Okay. Uh, this last question on the uh, Burger King Indonesia acquisition. Uh, somewhere I read uh, uh, we have done the acquisition of 83%. <coughs> Uh, while uh, it also says that cash-free uh, and uh, debt-free basis at 100% acquisition. Uh, slightly confused, uh, is it that 100% acquisition or if it is not, who owns the balance 17%? Sure. So, uh, yeah, I take that, uh, Suresh. Uh, so uh, currently, uh, as you know, and we explained the details in the, in the call when we declared the uh, bid for the Indonesia business, the balance is owned by the original uh, franchisee in Indonesia. It's a retail group out of Indonesia, very large retail group called Mitra Adipakasa Group. Uh, if you go back to those transcripts, you will realize that uh, you know besides acquiring 83% of this business, uh, one of the conditions to bid for this business was to infuse uh, $40 million into the Indonesia business. Uh, because the Indonesia business is, is likely to grow from where they are today, which is about 176 restaurants to about 350 over the next five years. Uh, so if you look at that $183 million, that's the enterprise value, uh, post all the adjustment in terms of lease, lease, liability, debt, debt, related, normalized working capital, uh, the equity value of this will come anywhere between 125 to 130. We are currently uh, acquiring 83.5%. Uh, post the infusion of $40 million, uh, the primary infusion into the Indonesia business for good expansion, we believe we will end up owning about 90% of the budget in Indonesia, and 10% will continue to be held by the partner, which is Mitra Group. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, reports to your time. That would be our last question for today. I now hand the conference over to the management for their closing comments. Thank you, and over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much again. Uh, really appreciate everyone joining the call. Uh, you know, your enthusiasm with the questions. Thank you for that as well. Um, you know, we've had a good quarter, uh, and we're not sitting on it. As a team, uh, we are, you know, continuing to address the business Address the tools of the business, continue to plan around the business, getting ready for next year. Uh, I think this uh, acquisition of uh, our business in Indonesia uh, and uh, continuing to grow that business over there, growing, growing the business over here, building cafes here in India, building cafes in Indonesia, will become part of what we will be doing going into next year. Uh, we feel strongly about uh, next year. We, we feel that... Uh, you know, uh, as things come back to normalcy, that uh, the economic model that we have put together in the last two years is becoming even stronger. Uh, and we feel that uh, this will be a driving force uh, to what we will do in the next year. So uh, thank you again for joining the call. I really appreciate it. Please stay safe uh, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Edelweiss Securities, that concludes this conference. Thank you all for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.